for the introduction and thanks to everyone attending this afternoon's uh, workshop sessions. I'd like to share with you some of the key concepts surrounding the determination of impurity profile equivalence as it relates to FDA's published draft guidance on post-approval changes to drug substances. In September of 2018, FDA published the draft guidance for industry entitled Post-Approval Changes to Drug Substances. Uh, it's classified in the category of drugs and the subcategory of pharmaceutical quality, CMC. Um, it focuses on changes to uh, drug substance manufacturing during a drug product application's post-approval period. It applies to holders of approved uh, new drug and abbreviated new drug applications, as well as new animal drug and abbreviated new animal drug applications, and the holders of drug master files and veterinary master files who want to make a change to the drug substance manufacturing uh, during the drug product uh, post-approval period. Specifically, uh, it addresses how the risk of one or more changes to the drug substance manufacturing should be assessed and provides recommendations regarding the documentation needed to support such changes for the drug substance. And uh, where applicable, also provides recommendations um, for what documentation should be provided for the drug product that is ultimately made from uh, the changed drug substance. Uh, I'd like to note that um, FDA's guidance documents, including uh, draft guidances such as this one, uh, do not establish any legally enforceable responsibilities. Instead, um, guidances like this describe the agency's current thinking on a topic and should be viewed as recommendations um, unless there are specific regulatory or statutory uh, requirements cited uh, within the guidance. And anytime you see the word should uh, appear in agency guidances, uh, you should take that to mean that something is suggested or recommended, uh, but not required. Let's look at the scope of this guidance. It applies uh, to synthetic drug substances and the synthetic steps involved in the preparation of semi-synthetic drug substances. Um, it includes a discussion of facility scale and equipment changes um, associated with all steps of drug substance manufacturing. It also discusses specification changes to starting materials, uh, other raw materials, intermediates, including uh, the unfinished drug substance and of course the final drug substance. Um, it includes um, discussion of synthetic manufacturing process changes, uh, changes to the source of the drug substance, which can include multiple of the above uh, specified changes, as well as uh, changes to the container closure system of the drug substance. Please note that the guidance does not apply to post-approval changes to the categories of drug substances that are shown on the screen now, uh, including peptides, oligonucleotides, radiopharmaceuticals, and drug substance isolated from natural sources or those produced by procedures involving biotechnology, non-synthetic steps of semi-synthetic drug substance syntheses, and complex active ingredients as defined in the GDUFA 2 commitment letter. Any modification to drug substance manufacturing carries some risk of causing an adverse impact on quality. Each drug substance manufacturer should assess the particular proposed modification to their drug substance to determine the risk associated with that change. Certain modifications, such as equipment changes, are generally viewed as less likely to result in an adverse impact than others, such as an actual change to the synthetic root uh, of the drug substance. Late stage changes in the manufacturing process are also generally viewed as more likely to have an adverse impact on the quality of the drug substance compared to um, changes made earlier in the process. A central principle of the guidance uh, is that a change in the drug substance manufacturing process can be adequately assessed by comparing three consecutive pilot or commercial scale batches of pre and post modification material. The evaluation may include a comparison of impurities in the pre and post modification material, including intermediates, unfinished drug substance, uh, and the drug substance itself. A comparison of the drug substance's physical properties and stability data can also be included. 
The impurity profile evaluation uh, of an isolated material can uh, be compared uh, to uh, its equivalent uh, of that pre-change material. If they are the same pre-change and post-change, then uh, the drug substance's impurity profile is considered to be unaffected by the modification. Uh, it's important to determine the stage in the manufacturing process at which the impurities should be evaluated, uh, including um, once you determine uh, the correct stage, then you can determine the levels of uh, existing impurities and new impurities, uh, especially with regard to ICHQ3A, uh, residual solvents with regard to ICHQ3C, and uh, inorganic substances or elemental impurities uh, per ICHQ3D. It's also important to uh, determine the potential for formation of mutagenic and unusually toxic uh, impurities, including nitrosamines. So uh, risk assessment per ICHM7 and FDA's guidance on the control of nitrosamine impurities in human drugs, uh, which was published in September of 2020. Uh, keep in mind that adequate uh, analytical procedures um, should be used uh, for the above purposes so that uh, if new impurities are being searched for, uh, it's known that they uh, would be detected. If the manufacturing uh, modification occurs at an upstream uh, step before the final intermediate uh, and equivalence cannot be demonstrated uh, for the intermediate isolated immediately following the change step, uh, the impurity search can be extended uh, to the next downstream intermediate. Uh, in addition, uh, the impurity search should also be expanded to include appropriate downstream impurities that may be formed during the manufacturing process. The evaluation process should be repeated on downstream intermediates up to and including the drug substance if necessary. Let's look at some examples. In this case, I've shown a process which is four steps long from the regulatory starting material to the drug substance, passing through three isolated intermediates. There's a modification in the process that occurs at step two. So intermediate two is the immediate uh, post-change uh, isolated intermediate. Um, what we do in this case is to evaluate the uh, impurity profile of intermediate to pre-change and post-change. Um, if those impurity profiles were the same, then what we would do is do uh, a Q3D uh, risk assessment uh, for the potential introduction of uh, any elemental impurities based on the changes made to step two, and then look at the downstream steps three and four to see if there's any uh, potential for um, mutagenic impurity formation from any changes, additions, or deletions of reagents in step two, uh, which could potentially um, uh, be reactive in the downstream process. So if all those things turned out okay, then this uh, overall uh, evaluation could demonstrate the impurity profile uh, equivalence uh, of this uh, intermediate number two. Let's look at the same process now, except we'll move the modification from step two to step one. So now intermediate one is the immediate uh, post-modification uh, isolated intermediate. In this case, uh, if the impurity profiles of an intermediate one are identical pre and post change, and there's no uh, uh, change in uh, the risk assessment of elemental impurities based on the changes in step one, and there's no uh, potential for formation of mutagenic impurities uh, in a slightly longer downstream process now, steps two, three, and four. If those steps are, are cleared of uh, potential uh, new mutagenic impurities uh, being uh, formed based on the changes in step one, then we can say that the impurity profile uh, of an intermediate one pre and post change uh, is equivalent. Now let's use the same basic process 
also looking at a change in step one. But now we're going to introduce a new impurity in the modified process. So let's call that impurity X. It's a new impurity that shows up in the modified process in intermediate one after the change in step one. It does not show up in the original process. So what we'd like to do is see uh, if this impurity um, can be purged uh, from uh, the process uh, without any additional changes. So we test intermediate two and compare it to the pre-change intermediate two. Well, there was no impurity X in intermediate one in the original process, so it's not expected to show up in intermediate two. When we check the modified process, we see any impurity X that was present in intermediate one has been purged uh, from intermediate uh, two uh, during the step two uh, of the process. So at this point, you might uh, do your uh, ICH Q3D and M7 uh, check for uh, elemental impurities and potentially mutagenic impurities uh, and think that uh, impurity profile equivalence uh, uh, could be demonstrated. But that would be an insufficient um, evaluation because although the uh, impurity uh, profile uh, equivalence was uh, extended to the next step, it was not properly expanded. Let's take a look at the same scheme so you can see what I mean uh, by that. We have a modified process which uh, generates uh, impurity X uh, as a new impurity in intermediate one in the modified process. Uh, so we expanded the search of the impurity profiles and shown that uh, impurity X was not present, but we didn't check for any potential downstream impurities uh, that could be formed from impurity X. So in this case, impurity Y uh, in intermediate two is a potential uh, downstream analog of impurity X. So for instance, maybe uh, impurity X is uh, a regioisomer of intermediate one that forms uh, in the modified process. That uh, impurity could continue to react uh, in step two. So what we should do is uh, compare the intermediate uh, um, number two impurity profiles uh, and including a search for impurity Y, which could form from impurity X. Now we already know that impurity Y is not going to be present uh, in the original process because impurity X uh, was not present in intermediate number one. When we do our search, we can see that uh, we already knew impurity X is purged and we don't see any impurity Y. So both impurity X uh, in intermediate uh, one has been purged from intermediate two and impurity Y is also not present in impurity two. So the impurity profiles uh, of intermediate two in this case pre and post change uh, are equivalent again if the appropriate Q3D and M7 uh, risk assessments have, occur uh, have taken place for the uh, remaining steps in the process based on the changes made to step number one. Now let's look at uh, what happens if impurity Y actually is present in intermediate two. So um, we already know that intermediates uh, one and two uh, do not uh, contain any uh, impurity X or Y in the original process. In the modified process, we see that uh, impurity X is present in intermediate one. And now we're going to uh, say that we found impurity Y in intermediate two. So although impurity X is purged uh, in the new process uh, during step two, uh, from intermediate number one to intermediate number two, uh, impurity Y is uh, generated and present in intermediate two. So in this case, uh, the impurity profile uh, are different. The impurity profiles are different uh, for intermediate two in the pre and post uh, change material. So what we do here uh, is again expand uh, the search downstream, but we want to make sure we take into account the reactivity of these impurities. So in this case, impurity Y could uh, react to form impurity Z. So we want to look for that 
uh, in the uh, pre and post change material. We know that it can't form in the original process. So now we uh, look for it uh, in the uh, modified process and we don't see any impurity Z uh, present. So at this point, again, if we do the Q3D and uh, M7 risk assessment, we can say that uh, the intermediate three impurity profiles uh, are equivalent um, in this case because we have accounted for um, the original uh, impurity profile plus uh, the new impurities and their downstream uh, analogs that could be formed uh, during the process. Let's look at a slight modification. In this case, we'll see that impurity Z is formed from impurity Y. So uh, to go back, impurity X is purged uh, in step two, uh, but it converts to uh, new impurity Y uh, in the modified process. Now in step three, uh, impurity Y uh, is purged, but it converts to new impurity Z. So the intermediate uh, impurity profiles for intermediate number one, intermediate number two, and intermediate number three uh, are not uh, equivalent between the pre-change material and post-change material. So the final uh, way to uh, check in for impurity profile equivalence is in the drug substance itself, and that is an acceptable um, thing to check. So um, again, there would be no impurity uh, Z expected uh, in the drug substance from the original process because uh, none of these uh, downstream impurities from impurity X, uh, which is not present in intermediate number one, uh, can be formed. In the drug substance, we check and see there is no impurity uh, Z present, and we know that impurity Z is non-reactive in step four. Let's say that's a purification process and there's no chance for impurity Z uh, to react and transform into anything else. So step four uh, is capable of purging impurity Z uh, from the drug substance if present um, in intermediate number three. So in this case, uh, the uh, drug substances uh, pre and post change have been shown to have an equivalent impurity profile, um, even though we had to go through all these uh, stages um, to get there at the end. So as long as the other risk assessments are good, um, we can say that uh, the drug substance impurity profiles are indeed equivalent. It's important to note that impurity profile equivalence is not a requirement uh, that needs to be satisfied in order for a post-approval drug substance change to be found adequate. So if impurity profile equivalence cannot be demonstrated uh, at any stage, at an intermediate stage or the drug substance stage, um, other uh, strategies can be used. One of the most common is um, including uh, new or modified impurity tests uh, in one or more specifications. So uh, raw materials, intermediates, or drug substance uh, could be subject to a specification change to include uh, a new impurity or um, a different level of a, a current uh, impurity. And that's uh, perfectly fine. Uh, of course, the proposed acceptance criteria uh, for those impurities should be justified um, either with spike purge uh, study data if the proposed limit is uh, higher that's been, than has been observed uh, from the batch data or just based on the uh, batch data alone if the uh, proposed uh, limit is uh, near uh, what has been shown to actually be purged uh, in the commercial process. Um, we should also consider downstream analog impurity control, so um, in, in line with um, whatever proposed uh, acceptance criteria and whatever data you have uh, to demonstrate that uh, those analog impurities are under control. And uh, of course, the risk assessment uh, for mutagenic impurities or elemental impurities should also uh, be carried out. And um, it's recommended to provide updated batch analyses or COAs uh, when such approaches are taken. 
and additionally uh, supporting method validation or verification uh, if necessary if the uh, tests um, have been uh, changed or added um, to the specifications, especially the drug substance uh, specification. Um, section 7 on page 21 of the guidance uh, specifically uh, talks about uh, specification changes and I uh, refer you uh, to that section for more information on that. In summary, each drug substance manufacturer should assess the particular proposed modifications to their drug substance to determine the risk associated with those changes. The guidance provides recommendations on carrying out this risk assessment. And uh, as a reminder, these are recommendations and other approaches uh, may be acceptable. Impurity profile equivalence uh, demonstration, uh, whether it be on intermediates or the final drug substance, is a popular route uh, taken uh, to assess the risk associated with changes. Uh, this impurity profile equivalence is not a requirement um, for a change to be found adequate. However, um, if it is undertaken, it should be uh, a complete analysis. So uh, there should be a comprehensive evaluation of potential impurities um, that could be present, um, whether it's from reagents, solvents, uh, byproducts, um, or uh, anything inorganic or organic. Uh, there should be uh, an evaluation of uh, the potential for mutagenic impurities, including any um, new mutagenic impurities that may be formed uh, based on the uh, changes in uh, a step or in an upstream step that may somehow impact a later downstream step during the manufacturing process. And uh, again, it's very important to note that you have to look uh, for uh, impurities at the correct points in the process for the specific impurities that you're looking for. So as we discussed, um, if we're looking for impurity X all the way at the end in the drug substance, it's good that that's demonstrated that it's not there, but we also want to evaluate whether there are any additional impurities that could be derived from impurity X that might be present uh, in the drug substance if that's the place we're looking uh, for uh, the new impurities. Here I have listed uh, some references um, for your use, uh, the draft guidance reference published in 2018, uh, the ICH guidances um, that I have uh, discussed, um, also the uh, nitrosamine guidance that FDA published last September, and uh, the GDUFA 2 commitment letter, uh, which I referenced in regard to uh, definition of uh, complex APIs that are out of scope of the current guidance. As a final note, if you have questions about the content of this presentation, please uh, type them into the Q&A box in the bottom right of your screen so they can be addressed during the panel uh, Q&A session scheduled immediately after this presentation. Additionally, you may send questions at any time uh, to the email address uh, on the screen uh, until March 19th uh, for inclusion in the follow-up webinar uh, scheduled for April 9th uh, next month. So thank you for your attention and I hope you enjoy the rest of the workshop.